afternoon. I'm happy. To, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I have my chat open. Okay. So um, we are going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we've tried um, in Poway Unified School District. Um, that have had some uh, positive results in trying to find and retain uh, qualified employees. And um, so I wanted to start out just telling you a little bit about Poway Adult School and a little bit about my consortium. So I'm the current chair of the Education to Career Network. And so that's a six member district adult education consortium. And we're all in uh, the Palomar Community College District boundaries. Uh, we have two large adult schools. Um, and those are Escondido Adult School and Vista Adult School. We have one I would call Poway, kind of a medium-sized adult school. Um, and then we have two really tiny adult schools, San Marcos Adult School and Ramona Adult School. And um, then, of course, Palomar College. The boundaries for this area, if you're familiar with San Diego County at all, the boundaries are pretty incredible and um, a pretty diverse group of folks that um, we're trying to serve. So it's about, it's a little over 2,500 square miles. And so again, if you're familiar with San Diego County, we're talking about Borrego Springs, Julian to the east. Um, and then to the north, uh, Valley Center, Palma, uh, Fallbrook, um, and then all the way to Camp Pendleton on the west. So it's a really big area. And when we think about um, the different kinds of needs, just the difference um, for Poway Unified School District, for example, the majority of our district is in the city of San Diego. Um, but the difference between Poway Unified School District demographics and Valley Center demographics or Escondido demographics are very, very diverse. And so we, region, we just had um, our regional community forum. And um, one of the things, one of the data points that we looked at, and this was all helping us to inform our uh, new three-year plan, uh, we looked at uh, how many classes we canceled and particularly our CTE classes and how many classes across the consortium were canceled. And then we looked at what the reasons were that those courses were canceled. And um, the, what, one of the things we found was that one of the primary reasons that we canceled the CTE course was that we were not able to find a teacher for the course. And so that's one of the things that you may be experiencing in your region. And it's one of the problems that we're really trying to attack and solve and come up with some creative ways to do that. So very recently, we've started talking about within our consortium, how might we work together to, to attract and retain qualified employees. Um, I'm going to talk more specifically now about what we're doing in Poway Unified School District and Poway Adult School, and then we'll come back to that idea about what we can do as a consortium. So let me just forward here. So I'm going to kind of go through four different talking points. I'm going to talk about how are we finding employees, how are we attracting employees, what are we doing to have them successfully onboarded? And then how are we keeping those employees? So as we start talking about finding employees, the first thing that we've really started to focus on is getting the word out, talking to everyone about an opening that we have. And so we um, have put a notice on our website. That's the first thing you see. We're hiring, um, and uh, we created these funny little yard signs um, that says we're hiring. Um, and so, if you can imagine um, during COVID when we had graduates, um, that we created these funny little yard signs that said we a graduate lives here. 
Those are the kinds of hiring signs I'm talking about. And so we put those in front of our district office, in front of every school site to say, hey, Poway Unified School District is now hiring. So getting the word out. We're also putting those notices on our marquee. So Poway Adult School has a marquee, a street front marquee. All of our schools, or maybe the majority of our schools in our district have those marquees. So we're putting the, getting the word out in that way. We're also really trying to be thoughtful about engaging our partners and understanding what our needs are for hiring. So when I talk about community connections, what I'm thinking about is when our folks are going out into the community, that they are able to bring our hiring needs to the community with them. So for example, if somebody goes to a chamber mixer, I want them to know what positions we're really recruiting for and hiring for so that they're talking about that when they go uh, to the chamber mixers. We, like probably all of you, will attend street fairs or different kinds of events that our community is sponsoring. We might have a booth at the Poway Days Parade. Um, and when we do that, we also want to talk about how can you become a teacher? How is, are there ways that you can get engaged? Do you know somebody who's looking for work? So we're constantly um, really trying to be intentional about that work uh, rather than just talking about our classes. Um, we also are using our business partners. So like all of you, we have advisory committee meetings and anytime we have an opportunity to talk with businesses locally, we're talking to them about the openings that we have. If they are on the hiring end, so let's say one of our business partners is looking for somebody, we're also talking to that business partner about, do they know anyone who could teach the course? And so is there some possible way that they could help us with this? And then as I said, our consortium partners. So one of the things that we've really been looking at is if we have a consortium partner, uh, we had a, a recent example where Escondido had students for a nurse assistant program, but they didn't have a teacher. We had a teacher, but we didn't have students. So what's an opportunity for us to work together in order to satisfy some of those needs? Can students travel? Can the teacher travel? Can we um, co-fund a course? Um, is there some way that we can work, uh, look at sharing um, employees in this way? And how do, we, how do we tackle that? And then we've also done a number of things um, with, in partnership with our district. So um, I think you're going to hear a little bit about this from Laura as well, but we had a meeting a couple of years ago with our personnel commission and our classified employee union about difficulties that we were having hiring specific positions. And so some of those were custodial positions, some of those were um, instructional assistant positions, especially a uh, special ed instructional assistants. Uh, we've created a, an adult ed training program for campus security assistants. Uh, we have a bus driver training program. Um, all of those things are ways that our Poway Adult School is trying to help support our district. And so we're bringing in teachers, we're finding experts, the community is learning more about Poway Adult School, and our district's learning more about Poway Adult School. Another example that um, I have with working with our district is um, our district was through our insurance benefit provider, they were going outside and paying people to teach yoga and wellness for district employees. And so we went to the district and said, hey, Poway Adult School does those things. Why don't you contract with Poway Adult School and we'll teach those and so as a result, it's really helped to raise awareness. I think uh, across our district, we're a district of about 37,000 students. We have 
uh, 39 schools in our district. So I think all of us talk about adult ed from time to time being the best kept secret, but we're really trying not to be a secret and figuring out every possible way that we can get the word out about our programs and our services. And then coming into contact with district employees and they think, well, I could teach a course. And so the next thing you know, we have folks coming to courses. Probably like many of you, I don't think I'm unique in this at all, but we also advertise in our catalog that we're, you know, we have a little section that's, would you like to teach others? What would it take for you to teach another person? Uh, what would it take for you to teach a class? How can we bring you in? And we get a fair number of teachers every single quarter who just respond to that. Um, oh, this is an example of the little, um, this was on the website and this is also what the yard sign looked like. So you get this idea of what was, um, what was posted in front of every school. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about attracting people and the difficulty that we might have attracting people. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to talk about was pay. How do we bring people in um, and have competitive wages? So some of the tactics that we've taken in order to do that, one is we've tied our adult school salaries to our K-12 teacher salary scale. So step one is aligned with step one of the teacher salary schedule. And so that helps when teachers uh, receive raises, our adult school teachers receive raises. And so I think um, that helps to keep the wages competitive. Um, we also have a class of employee that we call community lecturer. Um, so this would be somebody who doesn't have a teaching credential and is teaching in our community education courses. That's often a good way to bring somebody in. And then once they know about us, we can talk to them about, oh, wouldn't you like to get a credential? Wouldn't you like to work in this area? We also have recently... Um, found another way to bring people in uh, where we're using this notion of a walk-on coach. So um, our, our high schools right now will hire a coach to come and coach football. So in this case, we're hiring somebody who's an instructional coach um, who can come in and we can do a labor market analysis and pay them competitively. So an example for that with our nurse assistant program, we were having a really hard time finding a registered nurse who could be the director of that program. And so the way we got around that was figuring out this idea of a walk-on instructional coach who has special needs uh, or has special credentials. We were able to look at labor market information and recommend a much higher rate of pay than what our own teachers are earning. So that, those are just some of the strategies that we've come up with so far. We've also started to offer an incentive for teachers who hold a credential. So let's say they uh, hold a multiple subject credential or they hold a single subject credential. And now we're asking them to add a CTE credential. And so we actually, once they clear the credential, we are providing them with a stipend amount that is incentivizing them to add that credential. And then finally, I wanted to talk um, on this topic about credential fee waivers. And if any of you were involved in the legislative uh, work and, and you know the CAIA or the CCAE talking points for legislation this year, one of the things we really wanted to bring to the forefront was the fact that adult education teachers were not included in uh, the governor's trailer bill budget that provided waivers for the cost of credentials. And not only were adult education teachers not included, they were expressly uh, excluded. So we want, really want to be sure that we bring that to the forefront because we're having as much difficulty as anybody else 
um, hiring teachers and that credential, the fees associated with credentials can be a real stumbling block. So I wanted to just take a little breather here. I've been doing a lot of talking and just hear from you. Are you doing anything um, right now in your schools? Or are you thinking about implementing anything that you think would be innovative or could help finding or attracting potential candidates? If it's easier, you can just unmute. Hey, Kathleen, it's Jamie. Um, hi. It's so it's so helpful to hear what you guys are doing and. I will let you know that one of the things that we found really helpful, and it's it's a really small tip, but we, for our home health aid class, we um, were able to hire our district, we are a high school district, we were able to hire our district nurse to participate in that. So she has a CTC credential, not necessarily a CTE, but it still did the job. And it was a really great way to just involved someone that was really interested in the health field in general um, and had a lot of experience. So that worked really well for us. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for sharing. I don't know. I think I'm going to go ahead and push us forward. I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. So um, another thing we and were going to talk about is um, onboarding. Oh, it's Sharice. Sorry, Kathleen, there was a comment. There was a comment in the chat. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. So Catherine in Ventura, you're looking at K-12 teachers that are planning to retire. Oh, that's perfect, Catherine. Great idea. Um, and seeing if they're interested in teaching a class at the adult school. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. So, um, the next topic is onboarding, and I know that Victoria is going to talk a lot about onboarding. Um, so I'll just give you a, a few quick peeks at some of the things we've been thinking about. First of all, is more of a concierge approach to personnel. Our personnel department is really more geared toward people who are coming in and working full time. And they their office hours are often 7.30 to 4.30. They're not geared for people that are teaching in the evenings and are working part-time. And so we've been working with our personnel department where we are the people that are gathering the documents and basically uh, walking the person through the personnel process. Um, and so personnel is meeting with our folks um, after we've already done um, sort of all the collection of documents with people. Uh, just to make it a little bit more friendly um, and easy for um, our adult school teachers to follow. We're also becoming a fingerprinting site. So we had been referring teachers out to get fingerprinting and there was a lot of confusion about which places they could go and maybe they would get fingerprinted and it wasn't the right place. So we said, hey, we're going to become a fingerprinting site. And so now we're able to serve the whole district um, by being a fingerprinting site to do those uh, live scan fingerprints. And then finally, we've been thinking about essential learnings. And so this is a practice that we put in place probably about five years ago, where we really said, what are the essential learnings that somebody needs to know about our whole operation? And so we have scheduled um, or we, we've created a document that says who, these are the people that you need to meet with and this is the information that you need to get and um, it's over a two-week period. If you're new you would schedule appointments with these different people and you're basically checking off your essential learnings. And so I usually meet with people on the first day when they come, and then I'll meet with them at the end of that two week period. And we take stock of what they've learned about our organization during that time. Um, let's see, keeping people. 
So, uh, you know, trying to think about perks, what are we doing? What's, what's in it for them to come to work for us? So some of the perks that we've been offering, um, we offer free classes to our employees. And so we ask them if you're doing, if you're attending a class that we want you to be a mystery shopper and to give us feedback on the class. What did you like? And so that would be something that we can do. Um, evaluation and goal setting, professional learning communities, and then of course, providing them with really um, like right up to the minute um, feedback. So when we get student uh, feedback about a course, we're getting it right back into the teacher's hands because I really believe that most of us are in this work because we are we feel like we're making a, dis a difference to our students. So getting that reinforcement and getting the feedback and the comments from students in a really timely manner, I think has been very helpful. So I am going to skip this second activity right now, Cherise, just because I'm watching the clock. And I'm okay. going to turn things over to Laura, I think. Laura's going to come next. And there are some comments in the chat. So oh, okay. if you can you. respond to those. And Laura, we will have you pull up your presentation. Kathleen, if you can respond in the chat to them. Okay, we'll do. Great. So we'll have Laura Chartier start her presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm going to keep it pithy. Um, and I'm not going to be singing over, even though my presentation is called CT Teacher Recruitment, the musical. And the reason why I wanted to call it that is because if I could turn the screen, here we go, is you'll notice, uh, you know, in those old Judy Garland and Nikki Rooney movies, it always began with some crisis and they needed to put together a musical so they could raise money and they can address the crisis. So for us, our crisis was, uh, as far as teacher recruitment or teacher shortages, was the vaccination requirements. We lost a lot of our CTE teachers because they did not want to have that requirement. Uh, labor shortages, as Kathleen mentioned, our school districts are suffering labor shortages along with uh, every other business. And of course, the great resignation. So people that just got used to working at home virtually kind of felt like, hey, this is great. I don't really want to have to go into work anymore. So they decided to resign. So, um, and you can go ahead and just un um, unmute for this if you'd like to share. What is your crisis? Like what is causing your district to now really need to lean in to teacher recruitments? Anybody want to share? Okay, I'm going to keep going. I guess everybody's got the same crises. So what we did is we put together like a little production team. We assembled a crew to kind of lean into this problem. We would have pre-production planning meetings. We put together a production calendar, like timelines. We conducted a talent search, and then we gave those folks the red carpet treatment once we found them. And then uh, every week we kind of review where we are in our um, or CT teach, teacher recruitment strategies. So let me dig in a little deeper to each of those subjects. So we put together a crew of talent scouts or subject matter experts. So for example, if we needed to recruit uh, CT teachers in the allied health industry, we had a subject matter expert um, in that arena. And if we needed you know, electricians, we had somebody who could help us with that. So basically those subject matter experts who could leverage their um, connections or the connections of other people's connections to, to get the word out. We also um, have a social media person. And so he did all of our recruitment on Indeed and LinkedIn, I think also Facebook, Instagram. And that, that actually helped us not have to rely on the district to, to just go there you know, with their recruitment efforts. We could do our own social media recruitment act. Uh, efforts. Then we had a human resources expert who became very handy in our onboarding process, and then a grunt. And this is the person that was willing to do anything, whatever it took. She got on the phone and she called 200 people to see if they were interested in coming and working for the division. So she was really invaluable to our process. 
So uh, as far as our timeline was concerned, we started with daily triage meetings. So every day we would meet from eight to 8.30 and just like, what do we got? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna do this? And then as we kind of built that muscle up, it became a bi-weekly meeting and now it's just a weekly meeting. So we're kind of sustaining our whole system. So we realized during those meetings, we needed to create two separate processes one for recruiting talent, and then one for onboarding talent, because those are two different workflows. Then we defined our roles so that not everybody was working like, you know, the whole crowd of people, you know, running to the left, and then that same crowd running to the right, we were able to split up and kind of cover more ground. And then we wrote, um, standardized script. So if we, we did a, a letter writing campaign to former adult education students who had graduated from our programs. And I have to just tell you, I wanna highlight that because nobody knows the power of adult education like an adult education graduate. And so we were able to really attract a good amount of folks from our former students. The tricky part was, is sometimes their emails didn't work or their phone numbers didn't work. And so we sent standardized letters and then those were sent back and then we checked the phone again. Like, so we really triangulated um, on that outreach and we sent out about a thousand letters to former students in different, different sectors that we were targeting. And then we also did some advertising. So one of our talent search uh, techniques was we provided stipends to some of our current teachers. For example, we have a um, a welding teacher, we needed more welding teachers, we would pay that person a stipend to go out and try and find more welding teachers. Like I said, we reached out to former students, we used social media, and like Kathleen, we were uh, leveraging some of our retired professional networks. So you may not respond to this because you might be eating lunch right now, but just what are the talents that you're looking for? Like for us, it's really CTE teachers, but what kind of talent are you all looking for right now? What's your big, um, what's that big push that you really need to, to make for your school district? If you feel more comfortable putting in the chat, you can put it in the chat too. So is it ESL teachers, academic teachers, CTE teachers, out of classroom support, administrators? I'm seeing ESL in the chat, CTE, academic ASE and workplace literacy, tech savvy, just broad in general, tech savvy credential teachers, um, out of class support. So all over. It's, so everything. And for me, my district administrators. Okay, great. Well, we're all in it. We're all in it together. So hopefully some of these ideas are going to help you find some of these, these needs that you're looking for. Let me go to something else I'd like to highlight because this really is a best practice for us. A lot of our, a lot of the folks who are in the CTE field don't feel comfortable applying for a job with a resume or getting an, do, attending an interview, or they just don't have those skills. So we wanted to make it really easy for them. So we established weekly teacher exploration meetings. So as our uh, talent uh, scouts were out in the world, we could always uh, say, hey, attend this meeting on Friday at lunchtime and we'll tell you more. So it was like a funnel that we could send all of our prospective applicants to and they could all attend this exploration meeting together, get the basic information that they might need, have their questions answered to decide if they wanted to continue or reassure them that they could do the job, you know, and kind of share that, you know, we're going to help them. And then at that meeting, if they were interested in moving along, they were uh, assigned a coach. So I know um, Kathleen mentioned this as well, but this is really important because especially in a district the size of LA Unified, people, it's very hard to navigate such a large system. So if you have a coach who can, you know, help be with you through all the steps, it gives you a sense of um, safety, you're providing that red carpet treatment. And our coaches, I have to say, really went above and beyond. So for example, a lot of the CTE 
uh, applicants, they work Monday through Friday, they weren't going to be able to get down to the LA County Office of Education to submit their uh, credentialing documents. So they would go pick up the documents or meet them at Starbucks, pick up the documents, and then drive those documents to LACO for them or sit with them, you know, and help them, you know, on the computer to complete whatever documents they needed. They really provided some great handholding. We even <laughs> have enrolled some of the, the applicants in the uh, high set prep class because they just didn't they didn't have their HSC or high school diploma which was a requirement for some of these positions so we were able to enroll them in our programs to help them get ready so that I want to just highlight that this was really helpful and then here's kind of our our flow, because with LA Unified, it's like invading a small country, right? We got to put together like this huge like plan of action for the, our timeline. So this is what it looks like for us. So we had schools doing teacher recruitment. We had our central office teacher recruitment effort, and we were all sending those folks to our teacher exploration session. Then if they were interested, they were assigned a processing coach that would help them with their credentialing packet and help this help them be aware of this is where you are you know checking in with them every week this is what's happening and then we could also communicate with the principals like you have somebody we have a good one you know an mc3 teacher on you know on the line for you so just hold on you're going to get to meet them pretty soon then they would hopefully get their c19 letter and then once that happened then we would do a pre-interview with the principal so the job was not posted officially we just were able to do that pre-meet with the principal to kind of get you know like hmm what do you think does this feel like a good fit for you and then if they did feel good about that connection then the principal could offer that candidate a sub greenie and the reason why this is important is once they're offered a sub greenie then they're eligible to be um to attend our induction program and be paid for that so and that is the very last piece is that we would have the substitute teacher enrolled in the teacher induction program they learn long-term and daily lesson planning schoology attendance single sign-on zoom just get those basic skills that they would need to be successful in the classroom and then they could be working on that while we're waiting for the job to actually post and then go through the official hiring process and then this is our reviewing the daily so this is how the team kind of kept track of like this is the candidate you know sector that we have and then this is where they are in the process and and the school that they're interested in working in so and this is just a closer look at that so our reviews are in we've seen about 78 potential candidates who've attended our exploration meeting we have 22 candidates currently being processed and we've had seven uh, processed and hired. So with that, I think that's the end of my presentation. And I, unless there's any questions, I can go ahead and pass it over to Victoria. I think, Laura, thank you so much. There are some comments in the chat. I know folks have appreciated this and we will be sharing that flow chart that you went through. I think it's very helpful. So thank you so much. And now, Victoria. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And again, welcome. And uh, thank you, Cherise, for your introduction uh, of us all and also for organizing this webinar. It's, a, it's really a pleasure to work with uh, Kathleen and Laura, my colleagues. Um, I am going to share my screen. And um, as you know, we're talking about new employee onboarding. Uh, and beyond, actually. Um, and I would like to focus, narrow my focus a little bit today uh, to two areas, uh, which are onboarding and then the beyond onboarding, which uh, is a much larger area, actually. And I'm only going to focus in a certain part of what comes right after that. Uh, so and just Victoria, to start- Victoria, your screen is not sharing. Oh, it's not? I'm sorry. Okay. Hang on, let me go back. Thank you. Let me escape. Let me go back all the way. Oh. Got to close another window. I apologize. Go back to my first slide and let me try sharing again. Mm -hmm. 
This will stop screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Yes, I do. And there, that should share. Now we should be in order. Yes, now we see Can you it. you see it now? We see it now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And I apologize, appreciate that. So I'm gonna skip over that. I already talked a little bit about um, the, the two talking points today. Um, and I'm going to share some of my uh, private and public sector experience with HR. And, and specifically, I want to start out about terms and conditions uh, and also what onboarding is. And I think it's important to think about really what onboarding is and what it isn't. Um, we know it's important and we know we all do it, but why do we do it? And really who should be doing it and, and also how? Um, and also uh, onboarding, um, if we focus on terms and conditions of employment, which we're going to do uh, right now, I think this will help you focus on some very first immediate steps for you to either take as a new administrator or new manager, or also uh, if you're an experienced administrator and manager to maybe review in terms of your onboarding process. So first onboarding uh, is, and here's the formal definition of it. So I'll, I'll let you just take a moment to read that. Um, and as we all know, definitions um, without context can have uh, many meanings to many people. Um, and so this, is a, this formal definition really talks about uh, information and being engaged uh, and a productive member of your organization, which of course is our goal for all the employees that we work with and our coworkers. What it isn't, and this is important, is a one hour or one day orientation. It's not your first uh, workday site tour or introductions, um, showing the new hire to their station and introducing them to the immediate group around their workstation or even on the job training. That really isn't onboarding. So we're gonna pause for a moment and look at some of the reasons that onboarding is important. And I think this really says it all. Um, management is doing things right. And for us, particularly in sense of educational leadership and leadership in an organization, it's doing the right things. Also management doesn't set, if management doesn't set the tone or we all speak with one voice or act in concert and consistently, we actually do a disservice to the mission of our organization, in our case, our schools and our school districts, because we aren't on the same page and there could be variations on the theme and how things play out in the organization. And note here that when we talk about disservice to the mission, we're really then translating that into meaning we're not really serving the adult learners who are our students. So looking at who we are, when we say we, um, most of our teams are made up of a manager. That could be you as a principal or a director. Uh, clerical staff play an important role. Our office managers, our secretaries, all our classified staff. And of course, the all important instructor, uh, the reason everyone comes to school and to class is for the education and training and the all important classroom aid or other classified staff. We have a lot of resource people who also are important to uh, ensuring the success of our students. These folks, these people are all our management team really. They all play a part in the onboarding of our new employees. If we drill down and look at what's included in onboarding, and again, narrowing the focus, and I'm here sharing essentially what we do at Mount Diablo Adult Education. We're a medium-sized um, adult school. We have two campuses. Uh, we have a large community education program. We have a very large ESL program and a large CTE program. We also have adults with disabilities. We do, uh, we have uh, family literacy, citizenship, and we have um, a very robust uh, parent ed program, which is funded by our district, but under the umbrella of parent of uh, adult ed and our adults with disability. So when we talk about onboarding, we're going to focus on certificated staff primarily today. And these are some of the steps that we take. Um, 
assuming for the moment that you have a great candidate that you want to hire uh, and have already recruited, thanks to a lot of the great recruiting ideas uh, that both Kathleen and Laura shared, uh, our next step would be an offer letter. Um, an offer letter is, and I'm going to switch over to the next screen. I'll go back to that screen. An offer letter is common in most of uh, the private sector and industry. Um, it isn't as common I have discovered in education. And I know you can't see this perhaps in its entirety or perhaps as clearly, but um, Laura C will um, put a link in the chat so that you can download this document. It's redacted, there are no names, but this is a sample of our offer letter of employment in this particular case to a full-time instructor. And I think if you look at some of the key pieces, there are obviously the hire date, the position, the status, but then we go into things like the credentialing, which we of course have to ensure that they have. Uh, and then other things that might not necessarily come out prior to this point, although they should have. And what are some of those things? Mandated training, what the work and school year really is, um, retirement plan, a letter of assignment, which I'll talk about in a minute, and of course, compensation and scheduled increases, sick leave, vacation, time off, and the all important job performance and evaluation. Hopefully in our um, hiring and recruitment and hiring process, we have already talked about all of these or most of these. But for you as a manager, and especially if you're not involved, like in Laura's case, I would imagine LA Unified is so large and most of us have districts that have different processes. We aren't always involved in all the hiring steps that take place. So our job as a manager to is ensure, number one, that they have all this information, that nothing's missing, that we haven't glossed over it, forgotten it, gotten so excited about the program and the students and, and what we're doing that we haven't talked about these things. Um, next is an orientation. And that would be, in this case, by me, or in, in your case, perhaps, if you're a director or a principal, to talk about the new hire's expectations, yours and, and how you will support their growth and success. Really zeroing in on what are they expecting out of this job? Is it a job? Is it a mission? Is it a first time uh, teaching position? You also want to share about your expectation as a manager and as a mentor and how you will support their growth and success in the organization. Then you want to schedule in our frame of reference and orientation by the program manager or program leader. So it's pretty much ditto above as to what you're going to be doing, but you will also then specifically discuss much more about the details of the program, the students, the curriculum, all those things that are going to be so critical for springboarding the new employee once they are in the organization. After that, we have for every instructor, and I'm going to switch over. Um, by the way, I have another um, offer letter, which is for a program leadership position. So it's a little different than the instructor position. And Laura C is going to also give you a link to that as an example. But I'm going to switch over to um, this, which is a letter of assignment. And a letter of assignment for us with both full-time and part-time instructors is our agreement with them. Uh, it's a little bit of a labor intensive process, but it does a world of wonders for documenting and in, um, what the position is, looking back at it historically, ensuring that the employee knows exactly what their assignment is uh, and all the details of that. Um, I will also have Laura, thank you, Laura C. again, for providing a link to our, what we call LOA, which as you may be able to see is a fillable document. This particular document is generated at the program level by the coordinator um, with the secretarial or clerical support. The program administrator reviews it 
and then the employee is requested to sign it as do the managers. In this case, the program coordinator is not officially a manager, but the administrator is. And what you can't see here, but you will see when you have the document itself, is that there's a reverse side to it. And on the reverse side of the letter of assignment, you're going to have um, more detail about enrollment, visitors, sick leave, uh, reports, class hours, course outlines, field trips, personal property at school, um, sale of materials, expenditures, department meetings, or accidents, incidents, children, and our handbook. So everything is included here for the first day of the assignment of that new instructor or a continuing instructor. They'll get a new letter of assignment each term. And for us, that's four terms per year. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because we're running out of time. Uh, beyond onboarding, we are really thinking about evaluations. And I think just to let's suffice it to say that there are two things I'd like to suggest to you. Um, and our presentations are going to be available to you. So um, I'm sorry that I'm going to give you the really, really short version, but you'll have an opportunity to review it. But I think what I would like uh, to stick with you is that evaluations in my mind fall into two basic categories. One is a review and one is an evaluation, a performance review and a performance evaluation. The reviews actually help the employee in an ongoing fashion throughout their entire career with you to understand their role, what, the, what they contribute to the organization, and it offers an informal emphasis on informal opportunity for them to learn, adjust, grow. On the other hand, uh, evaluation really uh, is a more formal piece. And I'm sure you all have them. Uh, often they're district mandated. Um, we have a process which mirrors what our K-12 instructors have, but it's a greatly streamlined system because we are unique in one sense in that our entire certificated instructional staff, full-time and part-time, are not represented by any bargaining unit, which gives us a certain amount of flexibility in how we approach timelines and how we approach some of the onboarding and evaluation pieces. But most importantly, the new employee really needs to not only hear from you how they're doing, which is the formal evaluation, but also to take from that how to self-assess their own job performance. Uh, so here's our list. Uh, and if you can see clearly, we have numerous check-ins, check-ins week one, week two, week three for the new employee, month one, month two, month six. And then you see we change to performance reviews or formal evaluations. So last but not least, I'm going to close here uh, to say that recruitment and reference checking uh, and the district processing are all important, but I hope you'll be thinking about a little more explicitly about how you schedule your onboarding, how you do your onboarding, who's involved in your onboarding, and consider, um, even if it's a much more streamlined offer letter of employment, it's a wonderful thing for a new employee before they come in to meet you for their formal onboarding to have this offer letter with all the details and then to come in with questions to ensure that they have an opportunity to ask them and hear from you and share more information. Focus on your onboarding, focus on mentors and mentoring. We don't have time today, but that's a big piece of the performance reviews when we see we need to make adjustments and then the informal check-ins as well as the formal evaluations. So in summary, Obviously, time spent onboarding and mentoring is time well spent. It is an investment of your time. It's a great investment of your time. And I emphasize the word great, both in terms of the time, but also hopefully in terms of the, of the results. It's your organizational knowledge, your support, and that of your entire staff who are part of your onboarding.
process. Uh, so I hope. Thank you so that much, this Victoria. Some ideas. This was great. This was great. Thank you to Laura, to Kathleen, and to Victoria. I'm seeing all sorts of kudos and praise and thanks in the chat. It is three o'clock, and I had hoped that we would have a little time at the end, but the content was so rich, and I saw conversations happening in the chat throughout each of the presentations. So I hope that if you had questions, you were able to ask those in the chat, and Laura, Kathleen, or Victoria were able to respond to them and address your, your requests then. We do have one more administrator forum webinar coming up and we want it to be on the hot topic, the thing that is of interest to you. And with that, I'm gonna ask you to just take a minute to think about what you would want that to be so that we can prepare our next webinar for you. Go ahead and type that into the chat, what you would like to see us focus on at the end of May, beginning of June as your hot topic. You know, the May revise will be out by then and budgets and such, but if there are other hot topics, please let us know. And then Laura C, I know is posting in one more item for her, for Laura Chartier's presentation into the chat. So you have one more resource there. So thank you very much. And I'll pause for you to share in the chat topics you would like to see us focus on for the next webinar. And we thank you for your time. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Victoria. And the evaluation link is there too.